Well, good morning, venue crowd. Well, I'm excited to be with you this morning. Y'all excited? Eh, eh. Well, it's Father's Day. I got a, uh, got a card from my eldest today. Many of you know Sarah. I'm not sure exactly if it was complimentary or not. Basically, without boring you, um, the card thanked me for being a nut. I don't know. Jason, am I in, is Jason in here? Am I a nut? Okay. All right. There you have it. All right. We're in Galatians. Paul spent the first two-thirds of this letter, which we'll be wrapping up uh, next, no, week after next, third. Um, first two-thirds of it, debunking the teaching of the false teachers. Uh, we can do nothing to obtain salvation. We have no merit with God. Our works aren't good enough. Salvation comes by grace through faith alone. It was Jesus' work on the cross that paid for our sin debt. So he's our only hope. We have to come to him, believing him, uh, putting our faith and trust in him alone. Now, last week as we started uh, chapter 5, the first part of chapter 5, Paul is warning uh, the believers who had trusted Christ and placed their faith in him alone, who'd been justified by faith, he's warning them not to go back and lean on their own abilities to continue in Christ. The Galatians had received from Paul um, the message of justification by faith, but now they're, they're being tempted to try to please God by doing their own works in their own power. And here's the reality for us. When we trust Christ to save us, we receive his righteousness. We, we have no righteousness. There's none in us. When we trust Christ to save us, we receive his righteousness. And so when God looks at us, he looks through that lens, he looks through the blood of Christ, he looks through the righteousness of Christ, and that's how he sees us. He no longer sees us with our sinful nature. And, and we can't do more after we've come to faith in Christ. We can't do more to earn more grace or to earn more favor, to be more accepted by God. Now, that, doesn't, that certainly does not mean that we can live as we please. When you, when you come to faith in Christ, you receive him as, as Savior and Lord. There is a point of surrender in that moment that you have to understand. It's not just receiving Christ to pay for your sin to forgive you, to give you a home in heaven, but you also surrender to him as Lord. You, you no longer live in a way to please your, your sinful nature. You choose to follow Christ. You choose to submit to Christ. You choose to obey Christ. And now the remainder of chapter 5 and in chapter 6, Paul is getting to some practicalities. We're, we're, we're not going to continue the message of justification by faith. We've got that. That's a foundation. We're grounded. We come to Christ by faith. We live in Christ by faith. Well, how does that happen? Paul's going to answer here in the balance of chapter 5 how we live for Christ and how we honor and glorify God. So let's look at chapter 5, jumping in at verse 16 and reading through the end of the chapter. But I say, walk by the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, and divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. Well, you could sum up the whole message in those four, first uh, four words of verse 16, walk by the Spirit. But I'm a preacher, so we're not stopping there, okay? But that's the whole message. Let, let's unpack that, walk by the Spirit. You know, we've mentioned before uh, in this series in Galatians that every believer has the Spirit of God, and I might say Spirit of God, Holy Spirit, Spirit, all the same. Every believer has the Spirit of God living inside of him or her. 
When does that happen? It happens at the moment of salvation. It's not a later on gift. It's not something you have to earn or deserve. But at the moment of salvation, you receive the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the one who can give you the power and enable you to live in a way that pleases God. It's his direction, his power at work in you. you. You can't do it on your own. You can't please God on your own. You can't honor God on your own. When you come to Christ, you come by faith and you're justified, and the process of sanctification is also by faith in the work that the Holy Spirit does in you. Now, the Holy Spirit has unlimited power, but in the process of sanctification, you and I can limit his power because it's our choice and our desire that makes a difference. The Spirit indwells every believer, but the Spirit can only fill those believers as they allow it. So here's the first thing this morning. Walking by the Spirit enables you as a believer to be filled by the Spirit. You want to be filled by the Spirit? You want to have His direction, His control in your life? Then you choose to walk by the Spirit. And, and here in the Greek, and I don't, I don't study Greek a lot, but sometimes it's important to point out. Here in the Greek, the word walk is, is a present tense verb. That means there's no time of completion. It's not a thing that you do one time and you're finished. The word walk, the translation of walk is to keep on walking. It's a continual action. It's a it's a habitual lifestyle. So Paul is saying, walk and keep on walking by the Spirit. The word walk in the Bible is often used just to talk about, it's a metaphor for daily living. We, we, we do that. We say your, your walk in Christ, your walk of faith. It's a metaphor for daily living. So the Christian life is a journey, and Paul is saying we're to walk it, and we're to make consistent forward progress. That should be the norm for every believer. It is tragic when you see a believer who came to faith in Christ 5 or 10 or 15 or 20 years ago, and they're still babies in their faith. That's not what God intends for us. We're to walk. We're to move forward. We're to have progress. Now, I don't know how many of you um, go to the gym. I'm going to start back tomorrow. You can hold me to that, okay? Write it down. When you go to the gym, if you're on a treadmill, you get nowhere, right? But unless you're on a treadmill, anytime you walk, you're moving forward and going somewhere. Let me, let me pause here and say something about treadmills because this really irritates me, Okay. I see people on the, now when I get on the treadmill, I'm typically running sprints at, at inclines, getting my heart rate up and down. I see people on treadmills reading books, talking. Now, now I'm not saying you shouldn't talk. Let, let me just be honest with you. There's one lady in our church. I'm going to make up a name. She's not in this service anyway, and she knows I do this. I see Susan at the gym on the treadmill, and she's just meandering along. And she's talking to this person and talking to that person. Every time I see her, I go, hey, Susan, it ain't working. You're not sweating. You're talking too much. Okay, I feel better. Thanks. <laughs> when you walk, you're supposed to move forward. You're supposed to go somewhere. Well, Paul is saying, look, when you walk by the Spirit, you follow his direction. You, you submit to his control. You respond in obedience. That's how we walk by the Spirit. And as you do those things, you're moving forward. You're making progress. You're, you're growing in your, your spiritual life. So look at 16. Paul says we walk by the Spirit. Look at the second part of that. So we will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Well, what's the flesh? The flesh is not just your, your physical body. That's not what Paul's referring to. That's not what Scripture's talking about when it says the flesh. The flesh includes your, your mind and your emotions and your will. In, in Scripture, the flesh would equate to any affections and desires that run contrary to God. That's the flesh affections and desires that run contrary to God. So basically, I'm saying to you, the flesh is anything that opposes God. Anything in you that seeks gratification that is sinful, that's the flesh. That's what Paul is talking about here when he says you won't satisfy the desires of the flesh. See, here's the reality. When you come to Christ, you receive a new nature. We know that. Scripture's clear on that. But the old nature is still present. Now, I've heard some pastors, I've heard some TV preachers actually say that when you come to Christ, you receive your new nature, your old nature dies. That's not true. That's not at all what Scripture says. You have a new nature, but the old nature is still present. That's what Scripture is referring to when it talks about the flesh. And the thing about the flesh, the thing about the old nature is you, you can't reform it, you can't improve it, you can't make it better. 
That's why when you see people either who don't know Christ or Christians who are not walking by the Spirit, you'll see them doing a lot of things to try to be a better person. Your flesh can't be better, and your flesh can't be improved. In your flesh, you cannot please God, and you can't serve God because your flesh is in continual rebellion against God. That's exciting news, isn't it? kind of makes it sound hopeless that we could walk in, in, in faith and that we could honor and, and we could please God. It, it is hopeless in your flesh. But Paul says here, if you walk by the Spirit, you will not gratify your sinful desires. You're still going to struggle. But there's absolutely no need for you to give in. Look at verse 17. He explains the struggle. Your old nature That's what you got at birth. You were born with that sinful nature. You were born with flesh. Your old nature doesn't disappear, but you received that new nature when you were born spiritually when you came to Christ. And so verse 17 says what's happening is there's a battle going on. Your two natures are warring for control. Your old nature is warring for control to get you to live in sin and and just pursue everything you want to pursue, every passion, every desire, no matter how evil. And your new nature is warring. The flesh and the spirit are opposed to each other. They're in conflict. It's a constant conflict. Look what Paul says. They keep you from doing the things you want to do. The flesh tries to stop you from doing what the spirit of God wants you to do, from obeying the spirit of God. And the spirit of God tries to turn you away from fulfilling your sinful and fleshly desires. And so your flesh is centered on your will and the spirit is trying to focus you on the will of God. So how do we win the battle? How do we walk by the spirit? It's really a matter of focus more more than anything else. It's a focus on the word of God. When, When you focus on the word of God, you see things from his perspective and you respond in ways that are pleasing to him. But if your focus is on the world, on popular culture, on on worldly philosophies, on conventional wisdom, that's going to cause you to have a perspective that is completely contrary to the things of God. As you focus on the things of the world and those philosophies and that wisdom and and what culture is doing, you end up with a judgment that is warped and you just add to the battle on the evil side because you're constantly gonna be bombarded with the world's values and sinful desires. I know you can't stick your head in the sand, okay? We live in a world where we're gonna be seeing and hearing things that are contrary to the things of God, but the key is where we're gonna let our focus be. Several years ago, I was working with a group of guys and we were writing a, um, a weekend seminar uh, for, for teenagers uh, called Growing in Godliness. It was primarily a moral purity. And I remember one day when I came in and we were doing some writing, I said, you know, I'd just driven in the interstate and there was all kind of trashy billboards. I said, you know, I don't know how we're going to help young men in the culture we live in. You, you can't drive down the interstate without seeing something that's going to cause you to have ungodly thought. And one of the guys said this, well, you know what? A bird may land in your hair but you don't have to let it build a nest. That's some good advice with the things that we face in our culture today. You can't avoid it. It's right in front of you, it's right in your face, but you can choose what you're going to focus on and not let those things build a nest. So so we have to take steps to counteract those godly messages. You you can't just create a vacuum in your mind and say, well, I'm not gonna think about that. If I told you right now, hey, I want everybody, close your eyes, everybody close your eyes, close your eyes, close your eyes. Okay, with your eyes closed, I want you to picture a giant, nine-foot-tall, neon red number nine. Let let that kind of burn into your retina, into your brain. A giant, nine-foot-tall, neon red number nine. Everybody got it? Okay, if you got it, open your eyes, look up. Okay, I want you to just forget that, okay? Okay. Now, some of you are going to stay on the number nine for the entire rest of the time we're in here today. You have to replace a thought with another thought. You can't just wipe your brain, wipe your mind clean. And if we're going to counteract the ungodly messages or ungodly philosophies in this world, if we're not going to dwell on those things, 
and, and be out of step with the Spirit, then we have to do something to counteract that. Paul in, in uh, Colossians 3, 2 basically said it this way, set your mind on the things above, not on the things on earth. It's a focus. You choose to not dwell on the worldly things, and when a worldly thought or an ungodly thought comes in, you immediately set your mind on the things of God. That's much easier to do when you've spent time in the Word and perhaps even memorized Scripture. Paul in Romans 12, 1 and 2, you know, you know the passage, I urge you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice. You're supposed to live for Him. And in verse 2, he gives a real key. He says, don't be conformed to the world, but be transform, be changed, be different. We're supposed to look different than the culture in the world. Be transformed, be changed, be different by what? The renewing of your what? What's it say? Is it up there? Yes, thank you. There it is. Mind. By the renewing of your mind. He's talking about not focusing on the world and its philosophies, but focusing on the things of God. And so if you want to walk by the Spirit... If you want to be sure you're not gratifying the flesh, you have to feed your mind. You have to feed your spirit spiritual food. I think I've said this before. I may have said it last week. The old Indian chief who talked about the war going on inside him, he said there's a black dog and a white dog, and they're constantly fighting. They're constantly at war. And how do you know which dog wins? It's the dog that you feed the most. So you and I, if we're going to walk by the Spirit, have to continually, day by day, minute by minute, get the proper spiritual food and make the choice to yield to the Spirit. What is, what is the proper spiritual food? It, it's reading. Not just a quick five-minute read in the morning to say, I had my devotion time and I'm headed off to my day, but it's, it's reading deeply, it's studying, it, it's memorizing, it's meditating on the Word of God so that we obey His Word. We read it and we study it and we, we obey it. And the more time you spend getting into the Word of God, the more you'll desire what God desires. And the more time you spend getting into the things of the world, the more you'll desire what the world desires. Verse 18, Paul says, The Spirit-led person is not under the law. You don't need the law when you're led by the Spirit. You don't need to worry about keeping a list of do's and, and, and staying away from the don'ts. You don't have to worry about that when you're being led by the Spirit. Because if you're being led by the Spirit, He's going to guide your steps every day. You know, the word law in Scripture is almost always equated with the flesh, with human effort. That was the whole problem, the uh, whole reason Paul addressed the Galatians. That was the problem. They were trying to keep the law, how? By, by the power of their own flesh. You weren't justified by the works and by the law. You can't be sanctified by works and by the law. It's all dependent on the Spirit. And if you live by the Spirit, you won't be bound by the flesh. You won't be trying to produce um, righteous behavior on your own. If you choose not to live by the Spirit, you will produce unrighteous behavior. And that's the message that Paul has here. The key, the key in verse 18 is the word led. Notice he says if you are led by the Spirit. It's, it's a choice. The Spirit's not forcing you. The Spirit's not driving you. You have the choice as a believer in Christ. You have the decision whether or not you will follow the Spirit. Your submission is voluntary. Those who are led by the Spirit. Now, verses 19 through 21 paint a pretty ugly picture of what our sinful nature seeks to produce. Paul starts off with this, the works of the flesh are evident. It's clear when you look at these works, it's clear that, that these things are produced by the sin nature. And, and there's four categories here in, in these verses. The first category are sexual sins. And you see there are three listed there. The first is immorality. What is, what is immorality? It's any illicit sexual activity. It's sex outside of marriage, whether it's premarital sex or whether it's adultery. It includes homosexuality, prostitution, any, any perversion of God's design that the sexual relationship is a gift for one man and one woman united in marriage. Any perversion of that would be included in immorality. Now, I read that and I think, okay, good there. But you know, I realized before you can really give yourself a pass on that, I think it's important, you know, you know, in Scripture, it's not just about keeping the rules, keeping the law. It's, it's, it's about the heart. Jesus talked about that a lot. 
You know, the law says don't commit adultery. Jesus said, I say to you, don't even look at woman with lust in your heart. And, and I think understanding that when you look at, at sinful behavior like this, you have to also think about your, your passive participation. It's watching these behaviors on television and, and in movies. Sorry for your toes. Just wanted to suggest that. Second in the list of sexual sins, impurity. That's, that's a very broad term. Impurity refers to any unclean thoughts or any unclean words or any unclean deeds. It would include uh, dirty language, dirty actions, crude humor. All that's included in that. And then sensuality. Sensuality very simply is unashamed boldness, a lack of restraint, a brazen display of evil. You don't care what anybody thinks. You don't care about anything. You're just into the evil and into the sensual and, and you don't worry about it. You know, it's pretty easy today to look around and see examples of these sins of the flesh and how they're, they're outworked in our world. And, and this week I was looking at a new study that just came out, a recent survey on the effects of pornography in America. Every second, every second, every second in the United States, $3,075.64 is being spent on pornography. That equates to $265 million a day. Almost $97 billion a year. Every second in America, there are 28,258 internet users viewing pornography. Every second. And every 39 minutes in our great creative culture, every 39 minutes a new pornographic video is being created in the United States. I thought of the words of Jeremiah. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick, who can understand it? The only way we can avoid the sickness that's in our culture is by walking by the Spirit. Second sins that are listed here, second category, two of them, and these are spiritual sins. The first he lists is idolatry. What is idolatry? Well, it's, it's bowing to other gods. Oh, well, we get a pass here too because we aren't involved in idolatry, right? What about this definition of idolatry? anything we worship other than God, anything more important in our lives, whether it's our possessions or our position or, our, or, or power or pleasure or prestige, if the Lord's not first, we are guilty of idolatry. The second religious or spiritual sins he lists is the sin of sorcery. That is seeking supernatural powers. That's uh, getting involved in in um, spiritual darkness and, and seeking power. Interestingly, the word sorcery in the Greek is, is the same word from which we get our word pharmacy. And the reason he uses that word to talk about sorcery is the ancient worship of evil powers was usually uh, accompanied with the use of drugs in order to um, create visions and, and trances. And it's interesting in Revelation 9 and Revelation 18, if you read through what's going to happen at the end of time, those are going to be, sorcery is going to be a prominent issue during the period of the tribulation. Third, third list, I know I'm moving pretty quick, but we need to get through this. The third list here that, that Paul gives um, are, are social sins. Let me just run through them and define them for you. Enmity, that's hatred. Total lack of love for someone, strife, creating conflict and discord, jealousy, resenting what someone else has, fits of anger, that's rage and, and outbursts of temper. It, you know, fits of anger typically happen when smoldering jealousy finally erupts. That's where you see fits of anger. Uh, rivalries or strife, that's selfish ambition, striving to get ahead at the expense of others, not, not worrying about who you step on on the way to the top. Dissensions, quarreling. Uh, divisions. Divisions are factions that are caused because of different opinions that frequently are substituted for the truth. Let me illustrate that very simply. That's why I have so many different religious groups. So many of them have replaced the truth with thoughts of men, and you see splinter after splinter after splinter of divisions. And then envy. Envy is not only resenting what someone has, Jealousy is resenting what someone has. Envy is not only resenting what they have, but it's a wrong desire to possess 
what another person has. And you can imagine what that would lead to. And then finally, the, the fourth category here in Paul's list are two final or two additional sensual sins. Remember, sensual is a lack of restraint. And so you see he lists drunkenness, which is excessive use of strong drink, and then orgies, which is simply drunken carousing, just excess, sensual excess. And he doesn't leave anything out. This list is representative. It's not exhaustive. You see that phrase, and things like these. I don't know about you, but just reading that list kind of makes me feel dirty. It's unbelievable that people would participate in in those types of behavior. And and look now at the, the second sentence, the last sentence in verse 21. Paul lists all these things, he says, and things like these, and then listen, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. He's saying to the Galatians, hey, these things may have been in your past, but if you surrender to Christ, they certainly better not be in in your future. These These are things that people who don't walk with God do. And so you read what Paul says here, you read the warning here, and you might wonder, so does that mean that these particular sins send you to eternity in hell? Well, we have to understand what he means when he says you do such things. Do does not refer in this, does not refer in this passage to a, to a one-time action. Is it possible for a believer to, to fall into one of these sins, to have sinful desires and give into one of these sins? Absolutely. Anytime you're not walking by the Spirit, you're not walking in the Spirit, that could happen. If you're not consistently walking by the Spirit, you might give in. He says, those who do such things, that means those who do or practice these things regularly, those who habitually repeat these actions, those who these actions he's listed here would be a reflection of their lifestyle. This is not an isolated lapse that you might have, but it's literally a continual trafficking in sin. You sin and you keep on sinning and there's so much sin, there's really no evidence of a spiritual life in you at all. Paul is saying, if you live in habitual sin, if you go on in sin, if you do not repent of your sin, you will not receive eternal life. You don't belong to Christ. Now, I mentioned last week, it's really important when you're looking at Scripture, it's really important to make sure you have the comprehensive picture and that you let Scripture interpret Scripture. All Scripture is very clear that those who live in sin, that those who go on in sin, that those who don't repent of sin will be condemned. Why? Because they haven't really come to Christ. And there are two very clear examples that should immediately come to your mind when I say that because I mention these all the time. In in Luke 6 and verse 46, when Jesus said, why do you call me Lord and not do what I say? Just saying with your mouth he is Lord doesn't mean anything. It's what's worked out in your life. In Matthew 7 and verse 21, Jesus said, Not everyone who calls me Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of the Father. Scripture is very clear. You can't live in habitual sin and claim that Christ is Lord. If that's not clear enough, consider the words of John in 1 John 3, verse 6 and verse 9. 1 John 3, John says, No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues in in sin has either seen him or known him. No one who is born of God will continue in sin. So it's, it's pretty clear from Scripture, people who have those kind of qualities in their life, not an occasional sin, but habitual, ongoing, continual sin in their life, they don't, they don't belong to God. They don't belong to Christ. Verse 22, but here's the contrast that Paul's setting up, and it's a very pointed contrast. Just as, just as there are certain characteristics that identify the ungodly, that, that list that we looked at, those controlled by the flesh, there are also certain characteristics that identify the believer and reveal that that believer is controlled by the Spirit. And before we look at the characteristics on display in the believer's life, look at the first phrase of verse 22. But the fruit 
of the Spirit. Two things you need to see there. One is the word fruit. The word fruit is singular. This is not like the gifts of the Spirit. If you read the, in the New Testament the list of gifts of the Spirit, the gifts that God gives each believer to, to edify and to build up each other and build up the church, the gifts of the Spirit you're not going to have all those gifts in your life. You might have one, two, three, maybe. You're not going to have all the gifts because the gifts are given to different people to make the whole body work together. But the word fruit is singular. You should have all nine aspects of the fruit in your life. Don't look at the list and say, well, you know, I got joy in my life, so I'm good. No, you may be a joyful person, but maybe not very kind to others. The fruit of the Spirit is singular. You should have all aspects of the fruit in your life. The second thing I want you to see in that phrase is the fruit is the fruit of the Spirit. It's produced by the Spirit. You, you can't conjure these things up. These, these godly attitudes should be in the life of everyone who claims Christ because you possess the Spirit of God. But remember, you can't produce it, the outcome God desires in yourself. Only the Spirit working in you can produce the fruit. He does require your cooperation. We'll get to that in just a moment. So let's look at the list. If you're walking by the Spirit, what does the fruit that you bear look like? The first thing he says is those who walk in the Spirit walk in love. What does that mean? Well, they, they love God. They live in that love for God and also for their fellow man. It's very natural that if you love God, you should love your fellow man. You remember the teacher that came to Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? The Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. So love reflects both on our relationship with God and our relationship with others. Those who walk in the Spirit should walk in joy. They exhibit gladness about what God has, has done and what he's doing and what he will do. You, you can walk in joy in the midst of turmoil in your life. If you're reflecting not on your circumstances, but if you're reflecting on what God has done. Those who walk in the Spirit walk in peace. They live worry-free. They refuse anxiety. Those who walk in the Spirit walk in patience. They're known for having a long fuse. They don't lose their temper. Those who walk in the Spirit walk in kindness. What is kindness? It's showing genuine concern for the need of others. And kindness simply moves you to, to action. Those who walk in the Spirit walk in goodness. Their actions reflect virtue, reflect holiness. Those who walk in the Spirit walk in faithfulness. They're steadfast in their trust of God and their, and their trust in His Word. Those who walk in the Spirit walk in gentleness. It means their lives are characterized by, by humility and, and grace and thankfulness. And those who walk in the Spirit walk in self-control. They have moderation. They have, they have restraint. That they're able to say no to the flesh. That's what he means by self-control. So I said, the Spirit produces these fruits. You can't produce them yourself, but he requires cooperation from you. What, what is the cooperation? It's in verse 24. Paul says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. You remember, when you came to Christ, your sin nature didn't cease to exist. Your spirit was raised to a new life with the spirit of God in you, but the old desires of your flesh don't immediately disappear. They don't disappear until you're in heaven and free from the presence of sin. Your, your salvation freed you from the power of sin, freed you from the penalty of sin, but you and I won't be free from the presence of sin until we're in glory one day. And so there's gonna be this ongoing battle because your body, although your body, your, your body in and of itself is not sinful, it naturally craves comfort and pleasure. And if you don't hold it in check, you will succumb to temptation and you'll produce the works of the flesh described in verses 19 through 21. You see, if, if you continue in sin, if you don't deal with sin, that sin becomes entrenched in your flesh. And your old nature becomes more and more dominant and you produce more and more sin. And it's a vicious cycle when you don't deal with sin because you end up getting entrenched and it dominates your life. So what does Paul say here in verse 24? He says, we must crucify the flesh along with our sinful passions and desires crucify the flesh. It's not something done to you. It's not something done for you. You crucify your flesh. It, it's a deliberate choice. Now, why did Paul 
talk about crucifying the flesh. Well, in the ancient world, when Paul was writing, crucifixion was the vilest, most shameful form of death. It was reserved for the worst criminals. Those are the ones who were crucified. And I think Paul used crucify here because he wanted us to understand that our flesh is not to be treated gently or kindly. Our flesh is to be treated harshly. Our our sin nature deserves swift and harsh punishment. That's what Paul's trying to communicate. Think of of sin, think of the, the temptation to sin as a rattlesnake poised to strike and the Holy Spirit hands you a shotgun. You gonna play with it? Are you going to kill it? That's the, the picture here that Paul is giving. And crucifixion was not only very vile and very shameful, but it was also, at that time, the most painful form of execution. I think Paul is communicating to us when we really decide to put the flesh to death, it's going to be painful. There's some parts of our old nature that don't want to die. Remember verse 17, we read that the flesh and the spirit are continual conflict with each other. What does continual mean? Every moment, every hour, every day, the flesh and the spirit are in battle. And so every moment, every hour, every day, our calling is to crucify the flesh, to walk with Christ. Let me get real practical. And if you're taking notes, just just five things here. How, How do we do that? How do we make sure that the spirit who indwells us fills us? How do we make sure that he has complete control? What, what do we mean? What are the steps? What are the practical steps to walking by the Spirit? Step number one, it's a daily decision. You daily decide that you want to live a life, you desire to live a life pleasing to God. And that kind of daily decision for me is every morning, first thing when my feet hit the floor is praying that to God. God, I want to walk by your Spirit today. God, I don't, I don't want to walk in the flesh. Today, I choose to obey your spirit. It's a daily decision followed by a daily, continual surrender to the spirit, giving him control. It's deciding you're going to surrender no matter what. And, and the great thing I said a moment ago, if you don't keep your flesh, if you don't keep sin in check, it just builds into more and more and more sin. Well, what, you, what I want you to think about when we talk about a daily continual surrender is this. Success breeds success. The first time you surrender to the Spirit and you have success is going to motivate you for more. And the more you surrender to the Spirit, the more you'll choose to surrender to the Spirit. And that, that new nature rises up and that old nature is put down because you're not feeding it any longer. So it's it's a daily choice, a daily decision, a daily surrender. Number three, I I referred to this a few moments ago. It's a proper focus. Putting your eyes on the things of God instead of the things of the world. It's a greater God focus. And the more you're focused on God, the less focus you have for the things of the world. Fourth, walking by the Spirit requires consistent, immediate obedience. Obedience. What it means is as you walk through your day, you're, you're, you started the day asking the Spirit to guide you, help you walk by the Spirit. You're continually tuned in. You're continually listening. And when the Spirit, when you step off into the flesh and the Spirit convicts you, you don't say, yeah, yeah, I know. The Spirit convicts you and you know that when you're convicted about sin, you need to immediately confess and repent. You don't say, I'll, I'll do that later. I'll do that at lunchtime. I'll do that when I get home tonight. No, you stop right then and you immediately obey and you're very consistent in your obedience. That's how you walk by the Spirit. And finally, because we're going to step off the path, we're going to step occasionally into the the sins of the flesh. If you're going to walk by the Spirit, it means you live in a state of confession and repentance constantly. Confession and repentance. The Spirit speaks, you confess, you repent. What is repent? It's, it's a change in your course. It's, it's a 180 degree change. If I'm going this direction, I repent. I'm not going here or here, I'm going here. I'm getting as far away from that sin as I can get. I'm, I'm thinking, how can I avoid putting myself in that place of temptation again? How can I make sure I'm not putting myself in a place where I'm walking away from the Spirit and walking toward sin? Paul in Romans 13, 14 said it this way, very simply. Make no provision for the flesh. 
Make no provision for the flesh. To repent is to turn and to change course and change direction and change action so that I'm walking away from sin and walking to Christ. That's what it means to, to walk by the Spirit. Why is this so important? I'm convinced that many of us as believers, many of us who want to live for Christ, many of us who want to walk by the Spirit, forget every day as we get up and prepare to go to school or work or, or wherever we're, whatever we're doing during the day, I'm convinced we get up and we forget we're headed into a battleground. We get up and we start our day as if we're going to a play date on the playground. It's a battleground. And that battle's not just out there, that battle's in here. Those two natures are warring. If you don't walk by the Spirit, you will give in. You will fall to temptation. You'll give in to the flesh. And when you give in to the flesh and the Spirit convicts you and you don't choose to confess, you don't choose to repent, just like success breeds success, defeat breeds defeat. Walk by the Spirit. Would you bow with me this morning? It's always important when we look to the Word of God, whether it's in a corporate setting like this or in a private setting, just in your time with the Lord, it's always important when we look to the Word of God to ask the question, what are you saying to me? That, that same Holy Spirit we've been talking about this morning, he authored this book. So many people say, well, I try to read my Bible, but it's so confusing. Listen, if you will ask the author to speak to you from the words that he wrote, he'll explain it to you. He'll unveil the things that don't make sense to you. He'll make it clear. Walk by the Spirit. Every believer is called to crucify the flesh and to walk by the Spirit, and that is going to become more and more crucial in our culture here in America. We can't give in. We can't just throw up our hands and say, well, it's too big a battle, I can't. No, you can. If you know Christ, the Spirit of God lives in you. And maybe, like we talked about a few weeks ago, maybe he's tucked away in that back closet in, in the rooms of your heart. Let him out. Let him go. Let him have control. You don't have the power to overcome sin. You don't have the power to walk with Christ. You don't have the power to honor God. You don't have the power to serve God. But the one who lives in you does. Walk by the Spirit. It, it's not hard It's a challenge, but the steps are pretty simple. You may be here this morning and you don't have the capacity, you don't have the ability to walk by the Spirit because you've not given your life to Christ. As I said a few moments ago, it's not just about using your lips to declare he's Lord. It's about making the decision in your heart and in your life that you've asked Christ as your Savior who forgave your sins to also be the Lord of your life. It's a complete surrender. In a few moments, we're going to sing, have a response time. Hope you won't sing mindlessly, but you really think about what we're saying to the Lord as we sing. As we're singing, I'm going to be seated right over here on the front. There are pastors in the back by the big sign that says next steps. If you need to take a next step in your relationship with Christ, we want to help you with that. The vast majority of you in this room know Christ. There may be enough weighty issues that you need to talk to a pastor, pray with a pastor, that's great, you do that. But most of you in this room, can do business with God right where you're seated. Are you walking by the Spirit? Are you focused on the things of God? Are you feeding yourself spiritually the truth of God? Whatever the Spirit is saying to you this morning, in this moment, would you commit to obeying?